Good evening. My name is Randy Hollerith, and I am the Dean of Washington National Cathedral. On behalf of Mary Ann Buddy, the Episcopal Bishop of the Diocese of Washington, and all of us who serve the cathedral, it is a pleasure to welcome you here tonight. This cathedral is a house of prayer for all people, and you are always, always welcome here. As a point of personal privilege, I would love to point out that we are blessed enough to be the stewards of our very own piece of the moon here at the cathedral that is embedded in our space window on the south side of the cathedral, and it is lit up tonight. And as you leave the nave this evening, as you look to your left, you'll have a chance to see it. And we're so glad that you're here with us. Fifty years ago, final preparations were underway for an historic manned spaceflight that would change not only what we are capable of as a species, but a flight that changed the very way we see ourselves and our planet. This amazing mission that I would call a pilgrimage revealed not only the dark side of the moon, but it gave us the most powerful images of our small and fragile world. God's precious gift, a wash in an unimaginably large universe. I think of it as a holy journey, journey, not only for what it accomplished, but for what it revealed to us about our place in God's grand creation. We are so honored to host tonight's event and to have all of you here to celebrate this profound event in human history. Thank you for coming and God bless you. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the John and Adrian Mars, director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, Ellen Stofan. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Hollerith. Washington National Cathedral is the site of some of our country's most important commemorations of the American Space Program. And we are honored to be here this evening to celebrate our first voyage to another world. On December 21st, 1968, three men, one of whom is with us here tonight, climbed atop the most powerful rocket ever built and launched toward the moon. Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders were the first people to ride the giant Saturn V and the first to travel beyond low Earth orbit. The highest human spaceflight to that point had ventured just 475 miles from Earth. The crew of Apollo 8 would fly a quarter of a million miles away farther from their homes and families than any explorers in history. Apollo 8 was not supposed to reach the moon. It was going to be an Earth orbit test flight. But satellite photos had shown our rivals in the space race readying their own huge lunar rocket. And a bold decision was made to take our first moonshot. It was a last minute mission undertaken by a country shaken by division and civil unrest at home, and a long war abroad. But the call was not made lightly or in haste. It was the culmination of eight years of concentrated national effort and faith. Faith in the program and its people. Faith in the hardware and the astronauts. And the faith that we could rise to meet the challenge of a young president who would not be there to complete the journey with us. And it would all play out live on television at Christmas. NASA had told Commander Frank Borman that the crew of Apollo 8 would have the largest audience that had ever listened to a human voice. Their only instruction was, do something appropriate. And so, on Christmas Eve, our first envoys to another world read the story of creation from the book of Genesis. Although the first flight to the moon was undertaken by Americans in the year 1968, the crew understood that they were speaking to and for all the people of the world. And they knew that their words would echo far into the future. This was the start of something new. So they returned to the very beginning. 
An estimated one billion people saw the broadcast. I, to date myself, I was only seven years old at the time, but naturally, my parents let my sister and I stay up to watch. Humans had never traveled so far from home, but somehow, it was happening in our living room. Three brave astronauts in white flight suits orbited the moon, and I joined them in my pajamas, sitting in the carpet in front of our old TV next to a quintessential 1960s Christmas tree. It seemed like magic. But the magic wasn't circling the moon. That was technology, skill, and gumption. The magic was happening here on the ground, all over the world, in a million living rooms just like mine. Apollo 8 was full of surprises. We knew we were going to the moon, but hearing the story of creation beaming down to us on Christmas Eve, even the steely-eyed flight directors in mission control wept. And we know the positions of the Earth and the Moon in space, but no one, including the astronauts, was fully prepared for the majestic sight of our planet rising over the lunar horizon. The photo of Earthrise was our first real look at our home in the cosmos, and it greeted us all from every newsstand in the closing of hours of a very troubled year. Many people recalled seeing it for the first time with the one-word caption, Dawn. The message was clear. It's been a long night, but the light is coming. The immediacy of live television and the warmth of astronaut family photos in Life magazine, the voice of Jim Lovell coming around the far side of the moon saying, Houston, please be informed, there is a Santa Claus. The way the world experienced Apollo 8 in real time and living color put the bravery, risk, and most of all, the humanity in the endeavor center stage. It reminded us that there were real people, like us, up there amid the towering rockets and gleaming spacecraft. It invited us all along on what President Kennedy had called our greatest adventure. One of the principal architects of the Soviet space program the very people we were racing to the moon, said the mission went beyond the limits of a national achievement. It marked a stage in the development of a universal culture of Earth. In the midst of a race between rival superpowers, we found a defining moment of unity. Some of our bravest pilots and sailors riding atop repurposed weapons of war delivered a message of peace for all humankind. That was the spirit of Apollo. Centuries after it began, we understand the ramifications of the Age of Discovery. Apollo 8 marked the dawn of a new age of exploration. But even 50 years later, we cannot say for sure where this great adventure will lead. Our vision now extends far beyond the horizon and the new worlds we seek to explore are more than metaphors. When I graduated from college, there were nine known planets. Now there are thousands of newly found worlds in solar systems across the galaxy. When Apollo 8 circled the moon, there were three and a half billion people on Earth, and only 6% of Americans had color television. I know that's hard to believe. Fifty years later, the world's population has doubled, and we are connected in ways that Walter Cronkite could never have imagined back in 1968. How will we experience the first steps on Mars? If the world stopped in awe and self-reflection when our astronauts first orbited the moon, what will the reaction be when we discover life in the cosmos? The legacy of Apollo 8 is more than the moments of peace and unity that we celebrate here tonight. It's a conversation about how and why we keep exploring, and what we owe ourselves and each other in a world where the sky is no longer the limit, and how we treat a planet that hangs like a blue marble in space. Last week, the world gathered here 
in Washington National Cathedral to say goodbye to an American president who once celebrated that legacy with his own bold challenge. 30 years ago, President George H.W. Bush stood on the steps of the National Air and Space Museum and said, you who are the children of a new century, raise your eyes to the heavens and join us in a great dream, an American dream, a dream without end. When you entered the cathedral tonight, the moon was in the same waxing crescent that shined down on the world in Christmas Eve, 1968. I also hope you looked up right around 6.30 and saw the International Space Station passing above this very cathedral. 50 years ago, the moon was the finish line. But the prize of Apollo wasn't the moon. It was a world in which we could reach into the celestial sphere and find a new connection with the firmament. After centuries of dreaming, the limit of our ambitions was no longer bounded by the distance from the Earth to the moon. Outside the museum, President Bush concluded, in the decades ahead, we will travel to neighboring stars, to new worlds, to discover the unknown. It will not happen in my lifetime, but a dream to be realized by future generations must begin with this generation. We are here tonight to celebrate the 50th anniversary of one of history's highest achievements and to begin to answer the question of where we go next. If the moon is within our grasp, nothing is beyond our reach. But we must decide together where to start. Tonight we find ourselves, like that Christmas Eve 50 years ago, in the beginning. sequence start. The engines are on. Four, three, I think the thing that impressed me the 
the most were the lunar sunrises and sunsets. The horizon here is very, very stark. The sky is pitch black. Actually, I think the best way to describe this area is a vastness of black and white. Absolutely no color.
Long ago, an ancient Hebrew poet contemplating the beginning said this in words now found in Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was brooding over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Let there be. And we were and are. Centuries later, on far different shores, another poet, a preacher to be precise, a slave preacher here in America, late 18th, early 19th century, preached on that first chapter of Genesis that our astronauts read from. And that sermon and sermons like it that were handed down in slave fields of cotton was finally put in a book called God's Trombones when James Weldon Johnson created poetry from their preaching. And in one of those poems, The Creation, the old preacher reared back and interpreted what Genesis was talking about and told the story of creation and said it this way. And God stepped out on space and looked around and said, I'm lonely. I think I'll make me a world. The insight of that old preacher, whoever that was, captured something deep in the text and poetry of Genesis, that this is God's world, that we are here because the great God Almighty looked back and said, I'm lonely, I'll make me a world. That deep in the fabric of this creation, we are a part of it, not the sum total of it. Or to put it another way, it's not all about us. We are part of a greater whole, part of God's world. And God stepped out on space and looked around on the vast nothingness and said, I'm lonely. I'll make me a world. Old singers used to say it this way. He's got the whole world in his hand. Y'all know that song? He's got the whole world in his hands. The truth is, the truth is, we were made for relationship with God who created us and relationships with each other as children of the one God and cre who created us and relationships with this world, this creation that God has made. And God, I'm here to tell you, folks, I know y'all didn't come here to go to church. But I got to tell you, God made this world because God actually loves and cares about it. And if you don't believe me, ask Jesus. If you don't believe him, you got a higher authority to answer to. But, but, but Jesus, in John chapter 3, verse 16, Jesus actually said, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The Greek world, word that the New Testament uses to translate world in that text is the world cosmos. God so loved the cosmos that Christmas happened. The truth is, we were made for God, each other, and this whole creation. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, brother, in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. 
He's got generations yet to come in his hands. In 1968, three human beings summoned incredible courage, mounted on great wisdom and knowledge, and flew to the moon. And a quarter million miles away from home, they almost, I think, I wasn't there, but I've read about it. I think almost by accident, beheld something that no human being had ever seen before. They, they saw the earth rising from the lunar landscape. They saw it and they fumbled around, I guess, I don't know. I mean, they, they had to fumble around and find the camera and then they took a picture, but that was black and white. So they had to find the color film, and, and they put the color film in, and, and they got it in, and they, they thought the earth had disappeared, and they got another picture, and they got a picture the first time we had seen Mother Earth rising. And I wonder, I wonder if when they saw it, and then later we saw it, and when they read from Genesis, I wonder if God kind of gave a cosmic smile. And I wonder if God said, now y'all see what I see. God says, y'all, it's in the King James Version of the Bible. <laughs> and I wonder if on some level, God whispered in their ears, behold, behold, the world, the world of which you are a part. Look at it. Look at its symmetry. Look at its beauty. Look at its wonder. Look at it, behold, your world. Some have said that that was a moment that changed human consciousness forever. An article in The Guardian in 2013 said, and I quote, that up to the time when we first saw that picture of Earth rise, we humans thought the Earth was just the thing beneath our feet. And in that picture, we beheld a world of which we are a part, not the whole. Others have said that that photograph was one of the most, one of the 100 most impactful photographs in all of human history. Others have said the environmental movement to save our planet had its key inspiration from that photograph, that reading of Genesis 1, the spirit of Apollo 8. Every few years, the Archbishop of Canterbury summons the bishops of the Anglican Communion of which the Episcopal Church, of which this cathedral is a part, to come to Canterbury Cathedral for a period of prayer, mutual consultation. We gathered the last time in 2008, some 800 of us from every continent on this blessed planet Earth. We gathered at Canterbury Cathedral, and we prayed, and we studied, and we debated and discussed, with each day being set aside for a particular topic of faith and life. One day was devoted to the church and the environment and the world. And we were invited because we were bishops from every country on the face of the earth, virtually, to consider the impact 
of change in our climate, on our lives and on our cultures and our world. Many of the bishops from the Southern Hemisphere had much more to say than we from the North and the West had at the time. I remember bishops from Tanzania. One spoke of, as a little boy, looking up at Mount Kilimanjaro and seeing the snow-capped peaks, and now looking up and the snow-capped peaks aren't what they once were. I remember bishops from Zimbabwe and Zambia, once the breadbasket of Africa, now saying that the droughts and the growing seasons are diminishing, that the world, something is changing around them. But one bishop struck me in particular from the Pacific, from the South Pacific, from the Pacific Isles. He was the then bishop of the Solomon Island. Island. He stood up in our small group of about 40 bishops, and he introduced himself as the bishop of the Solomon Islands. And when he said that, I remembered, I remembered President Kennedy, who inspired the Apollo missions and the mission to the moon. I remembered as a little boy going with my daddy to see PT-109. And for some reason, I remembered that, that, that when their boat um, was shipwrecked in the midst of battle, that they went to the Solomon Islands and found dry land. The Bishop of the Solomon Islands stood up and then said to us, you who are American, you have the power. Please help us. Our islands are sinking. Our governments are in consultation with New Zealand and Australia to figure out how to save the people of the islands when the earth ocean rises and the island sinks. Please, we need your help. We need your knowledge. We need your strength. We need your help. And then he said, we have been your friends before. My family saved your president, John Kennedy, in the Second World War. And now we need you, you to save us. My brothers and sisters, we are part of one world. As Dr. King said long ago, what affects one directly affects us all indirectly. We are tied in inescapable networks of mutuality, bound together in a single garment of destiny. You will hear later in this program the words of Sir Richard Attenborough, who said, and I quote, if the greatest legacy of that first flight to the moon was the very discovery of the earth, then maybe our responsibility to that legacy is to protect this earth, our oasis, among the stars. My brothers, my sisters, my siblings, may this commemoration be a moment of reconsecration and dedication to mount on eagle's wings and fly, to explore new worlds, to seek out vast knowledge, and then to mobilize the great knowledge of science and technology and the wisdom of humanity, to mobilize it now to save this oasis, our island home. So, 
from this 50th commemoration of Apollo 8. Good night. Good luck. Merry Christmas. And may God bless us all on this good earth. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 Y'all want to join me now? He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 God love you. God bless you. And may God hold us all in those almighty hands of love. In the eighth year of manned flight into space, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration prepared men and equipment for the most advanced manned mission to date. You have to remember the year of Apollo 8. Uh, the country was in very bad mood, and it really needed something to bring it up. The CIA had the word that the Russians were going to try to do it before the end of the year. 400,000 people that put that thing together and made it work was an incredible performance on the part of America, and uh, we beat the Russians. Two, one, zero. We have commit. We have, we have lift off. This was the first flight on the Saturn V, manned. This was the first time humans had left Earth orbit, first time they'd gone to uh, their nearest neighbor in the solar system. While there, Frank uh, had uh, chosen to read from the uh, book of Genesis. The earth, and the Earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Which really uh, not only shocked people, but really caught their attention. So there was a lot about Apollo 8 that was a blow to the uh, emotional folks on the ground uh, listening to it. And God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. These two talented guys, uh, I'm just proud that I was able to fly with them because uh, it was a, a tough job done in four months and we did a good job. Oh my God, look at that picture over there. There's the earth coming up. You got a color film, Jim? Bill took the picture with a with a 250 millimeter lens, right? And he didn't want me to take. And <laughs> colored film. Well, in one one picture, it told the whole story of Apollo 8 and the people of the Earth. You've taken us, taken all of us, all over the world into a new era. The Apollo 8 and the Apollo program was a uniquely American program. It didn't have a lot of international input. And uh, when we came to the, uh, the moon in, the, in Apollo 11, finally, and we came for all mankind. The Americans came for all mankind. As I look down at the Earth, which is about the size of your fist at arm's length, I'm thinking, you know, this is not a very big place. Uh, why can't we get along? And I must say that the situation has gotten worse uh, since Apollo. You know, we ought to go as human beings. Somewhere along the line, I, uh, though I'm not a poet, I managed to say that uh, to me it was strange that we uh, had worked and come all the way to the moon to study the moon, and what we really discovered was the Earth. Exactly. Well, hello. I'm Jim Bridenstine, the NASA Administrator, and I want to start by thanking Ellen Stofan for putting this together with the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. You and your team have done just an absolutely magnificent job, and I have thoroughly enjoyed it so far. 
So please, if we could get a round of applause for Ellen Stofan and the National Air and Space Museum. And how about the most reverend Michael Curry? Uh, I'll tell you, when you were speaking, I was thinking, boy, I got to come after this guy. What an amazing job you've done and representing how important this mission was, was to all of us, uh, not just the United States of America, but to the entire world. And it is absolutely true that God does hold the whole world in his hands. And thank you for reminding us of that very important message. I want to start by sharing with you maybe a little history before Apollo 8. We go back to Apollo 1, 1967, which resulted in a fire during a test. And that fire killed three of our best astronauts. That was in 1967. In 1968, in August of 1968, we had the Apollo 6 mission, which was uncrewed, but it was also a failure. Although not declared so at the time, parts of the first stage of the Apollo 6 mission actually fell off the rocket. The second stage, only three of the five engines ignited. And that final stage, the command and service module, that single engine that would need to be reignited over and over again on a trip to the moon, failed to reignite even once. The spacecraft barely made it to orbit, and it certainly did not achieve the velocity necessary to test the heat shield as though it were coming back from the moon. And by the way, that single engine that had to be reignited over and over again on Apollo 8 that failed to reignite even once, it had to ignite to get to the moon, it had to reignite to slow down to be captured in the lunar orbit, it had to reignite to change orbits at the moon, it had to reignite to leave lunar orbit and ultimately correct that orbit or correct the trajectory to come home. Apollo 6 in August of 1968, that single engine failed to reignite even once. And we were in this massive contest of ideas, political ideas. We were in a contest of technology and economics between the United States and the Soviet Union. And in this contest, the next day after Apollo 6, word came that the Soviet Union was actually going to be around the moon before the end of the year in 1968. So in four short months, we needed to be around the moon in 1968 after the 1967 Apollo 1 failure and of course the 1968 Apollo 6 failure, although it wasn't declared so at the time. And I want to talk about for a second how unready we were to go to the moon. Mission control wasn't ready yet. Trajectories had not been calculated. The crew had not been trained in August of 1968 to go to the moon. Flight controllers had not been trained. We didn't have the communication networks ready in order to go to the moon in August of 1968. And yet, by the end of the year, NASA was determined that we were going to get there before the end of the year. Even more worrisome than all of this, that Apollo 8 mission, if we were to achieve this objective, would be in orbit around the moon on Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day. In other words, if there was a failure here, it would wreck Christmas not only for everybody in the United States, but for everybody in the world. And yet NASA rose to the occasion and NASA took the risk. Another important element that we've already heard about tonight, that lunar lander wasn't ready, and so we dropped it from the mission as an agency. And when I say we dropped it from the mission, it wasn't just that we weren't going to land on the moon. We didn't have the lifeboat. If that single engine failed to reignite this time, our astronauts would be on their way to the moon for the rest of their lives. They could be at the moon for the rest of their lives. And given the life support capabilities in that command and service module, the rest of their lives would have been four days, maybe. And yet we were willing to take the risk because what, what was at stake? And NASA, in fact, did take the risk. 
And what's so amazing, as we've seen tonight and heard tonight, on Christmas Eve, one out of every four people on planet Earth tuned in to listen to Bill Anders, Frank Borman, and Jim Lovell as they read Genesis 1-1 through Genesis 1-10. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and their broadcast reached not just almost all of America, but tens of millions of people behind the Iron Curtain where Christmas was still illegal. And they reached them with a Christmas message. That is an amazing tool of national power, soft power. The idea that we can change the perception of people all around the world towards the United States with space exploration and discovery and science. And that's what NASA did in the Christmas of 1968. And in a few minutes, I'm going to introduce one of my heroes, Captain Jim Lovell. So, I want to talk for a second about why tonight is important. We are remembering the Apollo era of the 1960s and 1970s. Had boots on the moon was 1972. But now we're looking at tonight and thinking, what how are we going to accomplish it? The President's Space Policy Directive 1 says that we're going back to the moon, and I want to be clear. We're in fact going forward to the moon. We're doing it in a way that has never been done before. This time when we go to the moon, we're going to stay. This isn't about leaving flags and footprints, but we're going to go with a sustainable, reusable architecture where we can get back and forth to the moon and over and over again, and we're going to do it with commercial partners. We're going to do it with international partners. We're going to retire risk. We're going to utilize the resources of the moon. Interestingly, today we heard some of our some of our from Genesis. And they talked about in that scripture that there was a firmament and God separated the waters from the waters, the waters below the firmament. And by the way, firmament is just empty space. The water waters above the firmament. From 1969, the first time we landed on the moon, all the way up until 2008, a lot of people believed that the moon was bone dry. We now know that there are hundreds of billions of tons of water ice at the poles of the moon. Water to drink, air to breathe, life support, but it's also hydrogen and oxygen, which is rocket fuel, and it's available and hundreds of billions of tons on the surface of the moon. That's an astonishing discovery. And we now know that we can utilize that as a resource so that humanity can go further than ever before. So in this architecture, we are familiar with what happens when we reuse rockets. The cost goes down and access goes up. We want to reuse the entire architecture. We want tugs from Earth orbit up to lunar orbit to be reusable. We want a reusable command module permanently in orbit around the moon. We call it gateway. And we want reusable landers that go back and forth from the gateway to the surface of the moon over and over again, not just landers, but rovers and robots and humans that can all work inside this framework of a reusable lunar architecture. It's also true that this architecture is going to be open. The last time we did this, friends, it was a contest of ideas. It was a contest between nations. This time when we do it, it's going to be open in a way that any country on the planet can go on a website and they can see how we do communications, how we do data, how we do avionics, how we do docking. And this open architecture will enable all the nations of the Earth to participate in our return to the lunar surface. And not just all the nations of the Earth who are interested, but also private individuals and commercial companies that also want to plug into that architecture in a commercial way. The idea being that we're going to retire the risk. We're going to prove the technology. We're going to prove the capability. We're going to prove the human physiology. And the final part of Space Policy Directive 1 is that we're going to replicate as much of this as possible in our journey to Mars. Friends, that's what we're doing tonight. We're talking about the Apollo era with an eye for the future. 
Just a few minutes ago, we talked about the firmament and the water below and the water above. We now know that you know, when, when our astronauts on Apollo 8 read the scripture, we, we didn't know there was water anywhere other than Earth. We now know that there's a moon of Jupiter, and there's a moon of Saturn, and Celadus, and Europa of Jupiter, and these moons are water worlds available for us to go make new discoveries and maybe even find out that there's life on other worlds. We don't know, but here's what we do know. We know that Mars has a methane cycle that is perfectly commensurate with the seasons of Mars. Doesn't guarantee life, but increases the probability. We know that Mars has complex organic compounds on its surface. And by the way, these discoveries were made just since I've been the NASA administrator for the last eight months. We're living in exciting times. Again, organic compounds do not guarantee that there's life on Mars, but it increases the probability. And we also know that there is liquid water 10 kilometers below the surface of Mars, protected from the harsh radiation environment of deep space. These are exciting times, friends. And so when my new friend, Captain Jim Lovell, talked about the waters above the firmament and the waters below the firmament, we didn't know it at the time, <laughs> but those words had very real meaning. And NASA is now following the water so that we can make new discoveries and possibly even discovering life on a world that's not our own. Let me tell you about Jim Lovell for a second. Jim Lovell is a, a Navy pilot by trade, go Navy. And Jim Lovell is a retired captain of the United States Navy. He's also a veteran astronaut of Gemini 7 and Gemini 12, and what we're celebrating tonight, Apollo 8. But he's even more famous for that movie that was made in the 1990s called Apollo 13. Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, Captain Jim Lovell. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for that very kind introduction, and I think you've laid out quite a, a future plans for our space activities. It was the summer of 1968. The country was troubled with an unpopular war in Vietnam, student uprisings, and the assassination of two prominent Americans. The Me Too movement was just beginning with angry women threatening to burn their bras in public to protest, and hippies were crowding the street corners. I finished my second space flight, Gemini 12, in November 1966. I was looking forward to being involved in the Apollo program. I didn't pay any attention to what was happening outside NASA's gate. A disastrous fire in January 1967 on the Apollo 1 launch complex killed three friends and delayed Apollo for 10 months. Commitment to land on the moon by the end of the decade was in jeopardy. My next assignment was Apollo 8, an Earth orbital flight scheduled for December 1968 to check out the newly developed lunar module. My companions were Frank Borman and Bill Anders. I flew with Borman on Gemini 7. Anders was a rookie assigned to the lunar pilot position, and this mission would give him experience with the lunar module for a possible later lunar flight. Two incidents occurred in the summer of 68. 
that changed our mission and the history of Apollo. Grumman Aircraft Company, the maker of the lunar module, informed NASA that a lunar module would not be ready for delivery before 69. And suddenly, Apollo 8 did not have a mission. Next, we received intelligence from the Russians planning to launch a manned circumlunar flight in December 1968. They were serious. They flew the unmanned Zond 5 spacecraft around the moon in September, followed by Zond 6 in November. Zond 7 was being prepared for a manned flight in December. It was George Lowe, manager of the Apollo program, who had the brilliant idea. In 10-day Earth orbit flight in flight to certify the Apollo Command Service Module, if it is successful, then launch Apollo 8's Command Service Module to the moon. Not just to circumnavigate, but to go into lunar orbit. Lowe figured the flight would shorten the time to a lunar landing, would test the navigation and communication systems, effects of the moon's mass concentration on an orbiting spacecraft, look for suitable future landing areas, provide close-up photography, and finally, give America the uplift it needed. We had just four months to prepare for the flight. NASA management had to be convinced. The Saturn V booster still had problems. The navigation and communication systems needed upgrading, and Apollo 7 had to be successful. De Borman, the change in the mission, answered his dream to beat the Russians to the moon. He had no interest in exploration. Anders, at first, was disappointed not to test the lunar module, a step towards a lunar landing flight. I was delighted. To me, this would be a mini Lewis and Clark expedition, exploring new territory on the moon's far side. It all came together on the early morning of December 21st, 1968. Crossing the bridge from the launch tower to the spacecraft, I saw 360 feet below the lights of the press vehicles driving into the press site. Suddenly, I realized I'm actually going to the moon. All that navigational training I had was for real. At 721, Apollo 8 started its journey. There had been no sign of a Russian launch. Our third stage booster put us on a long elliptical orbit with its apogee intercepting the moon in three days. We entered lunar orbit on the dark side, the moon nowhere to be seen. As we continued to orbit, Shards of sunlight started to illuminate the peaks of craters just 60 miles below. Finally, the far side was bathed in sunlight, and we stared in silence as the ancient far side craters slowly passed underneath. I was observing, I was observing alive that part of the moon that had been hidden from man for millions of years. Then looking up, I saw it, the Earth, a blue and white ball, just above the lunar horizon, 240,000 miles away. I thought, my world is only as far as the eye can see. In the country, mountains, hills, or grove of trees can restrict my world. In cities, tall buildings define my world. And in this cathedral, my world exists within these walls. But seeing the Earth at 240,000 miles, 
my world suddenly expanded to infinity. I put my thumb up to the window and completely hid the earth. Just think, over three billion people, mountains, oceans, deserts, everything I ever knew was behind my thumb. As I observed the earth, I realized my home, my home one of nine of solar system, it is just a mere speck in our Milky Way galaxy and lost to oblivion in the universe. I began to question my own existence. How do I fit in to what I see? And then I remembered a saying I'd often heard, I hope to go to heaven when I die. I suddenly realized that I went to heaven when I was born. I arrived on a planet with a proper mass to have the gravity to contain water and an atmosphere, the essentials for life. I arrived on a planet orbiting a star at just the right distance to absorb that star's energy, energy that caused life to evolve in the beginning. In my mind, the answer was clear. God gave mankind a stage upon which to perform. How the play ends is up to us. Apollo 8 slowly over to the, to the familiar near side and friendly landmarks came into view. First was the clear greater Langrenus with its terraced walls the Mercier of the Sea of Fertility. Ahead, I could see the Sechi mountain range winding its way down to the Sea of Tranquility. On Tranquility's shore, I found Mount Marilyn, a small triangular mountain that would soon be the stepping stone for the first lunar landing. By all means, the flight of Apollo 8 was a complete success. All spacecraft systems functioned as planned. Navigation and communication operations proved their worth. The timing of the flight, orbiting the moon at Christmas, provided a spiritual environment to read the first 10 verses of Genesis to an audience on Earth. Borman got his wish to beat the Russians to the moon. Anders became a celebrity for his famous Earthrise photo, and that one photo provided convincing evidence that many nations are but one world. As for me, the flight prepared me for my next lunar mission, Apollo 13, but that's another story. It was the American public, however, that received the greatest gift. After a year of controversy, Apollo 8 gave them a reason to be American. The flight of Apollo 8 can best be expressed by a telegram received by the crew. It only said, thanks, you saved 1968. The following July, I was asked to escort Charles Lindbergh to watch the launch of Apollo 11. As we listened to the countdown, I said to him, take a look at that Saturn V rocket. The spacecraft on top will try to land on the moon. But I could tell he was in deep thought, his mind elsewhere. I suspect that he was thinking of his own voyage, that perilous 34-hour overwater flight from New York to Paris. Suddenly he answered, Apollo 11 will be quite an accomplishment. But your flight, Apollo 8, that initial 240,000 mile voyage from the Earth to the moon, that's the flight I will remember.
I clearly remember the first time I saw Earthrise, our brilliant blue planet suspended in cold, colorless space. I suddenly realized how isolated and lonely we are here on Earth. But despite the vast distance that made the photograph possible, we had not lost our connection with the natural world. We had rediscovered it. We saw for the first time our one home together in the cosmos. The Apollo program overcame immense odds to accomplish something extraordinary. One of history's greatest competitions, a race between powerful nations, resulted in a grand voyage of discovery made in peace for all humankind. The journey of Apollo 8 marked a dawn of planetary awareness. 50 years later, we are at high noon, and the hour for decision and action is at hand. If the greatest legacy of the first flight to the moon was the discovery of Earth, then our responsibility to that legacy is to protect our oasis among the stars, the one home to all known life. The spirit of Apollo reflects some of the best parts of human nature, our curiosity and creativity, and our unwillingness to accept impossibility. Ideas that seem to defy us instead unite and inspire us, and once united, any feasible goal is within our grasp. But no matter how far our ingenuity and ambition takes us, through unknown challenges and unimagined opportunities, let us always remember the moment we left Earth for the first time, only to look back and discover what was truly precious. However far we may travel, what will always matter most is home. And all of us together, all of us here on the good earth. Thank you all for coming tonight. God bless and keep you always. And may we always be reaching for the stars. Thank you. <laughs>